Hello everyone, Dylan Schumacher, Citadel Defense, and we are going to start the Small Unit Tactics series with the chapter on Fieldcraft and Basics. Again, as a reminder, we are using Max Velocity Tactical's Tactical Manual, Small Unit Tactics. It's a lot of tactics in one book. Uh, great book. I don't get any promo or anything for saying, talking about this book, but you should own this book. Um, and again, we are going to use this as our textbook as we go through this series. So today we're doing chapter one, Fieldcraft and Basics. I would suggest that you read chapter one before you watch this, but if you don't care about that or you don't have the book or you don't want to get the book or whatever, that's fine. But definitely at some point, Go back and read that chapter after you watch this lecture because that's going to be helpful to further inform. Again, it's kind of our textbook in this college lecture series. So we're not going to, you know, sit here and read you the book, but we are going to talk about concepts from that chapter. And you having read that chapter is going to make this more informative. In the introduction, one of the assumptions that we made is that you are in general squared away, meaning you have a basic set of skills on how to operate your gun and possibly work with your guys. So we are going to continue to assume that. And there's only going to be a couple things we're really going to touch on in this chapter. It's important to touch on just a few skills or concepts up front because again, those are going to help inform your tactics. Good teams are built off solid individuals, right? It's hard to have a high functioning team if everybody in the team sucks at doing their job. But if you have a bunch of high functioning individuals that are really good at their job, you still can have a poor team, of course, if they don't practice working together. You see this in any professional sport you've ever watched in your life. Everybody in that team is exceedingly good at their job. Uh, that's how they got to be a professional basketball player or baseball player or football or whatever. Pick your poison. Uh, and then on top of that, they work together, right? So what we're going to talk about here is we're just going to touch on that first part of being a high functioning individual. Again, I'm already assuming you have some base of knowledge here. If not, YouTube is your friend and classes are your friend. Coincidentally, I teach those classes so you can come take one. When it comes to your PCIs or your PCCs, uh, PCC is pre-combat check, PCI is pre-combat inspection. The pre-combat check, that's something that you do, right? On your own equipment, on your own gear. Before you go out to train with your guys or before you're, you're gonna step off to do something that's goon-like, uh, you're gonna wanna do a pre-combat check. That means you're gonna go through all of your stuff, which we're gonna talk about how to do that in a second, and make sure that it's squared away and good to go. Because you don't wanna be the problem guy, because that's one, embarrassing, and two, then you'll die. The pre-combat inspection, that's something that your designated team leader is gonna do. However you work that out in your group of who's gonna be in charge, uh, that's something that the pre, that the team leader is going to do. They're going to do the pre-combat inspection to, again, check all the stuff that you should have checked to make sure that it's all in good working order. A helpful acronym for doing that is SAWPRESSO. I don't know how to pronounce that, but you know, it's, there's a million acronyms in, in the military and stuff. And this is one that's actually useful for us as normal people to be able to check out what we need. So the first one is security. Now I'll be 100% honest here. I don't know why that's there. I think it's just there because, you know, we always need to be secure. We always need to be checking security and security is super important, which, you know, is true if you're out and about, but in the context that we're talking about here with pre-combat checks and pre-combat inspections, I, it just seems superfluous. So things to go through and check ammo. Okay. Do you have enough? Do, do you have some kind of SOP, uh, SOP standard operating procedure? We're going to use that term a lot in this series. So make sure you get used to that one. Uh, ammo. Do you have an SOP for ammo? Do you have a, in your crew, do you have, Hey, we're all going to carry five mags or seven mags or 25 mags. What's your SOP for your crew? Uh, do you have enough? Does everybody have enough, right? When it comes to doing the pre-combat inspection, that's your job. Hey, how many mags do you have? I'm here to inspect everybody. Let's check everybody's mags. Let's make sure they're all fully loaded. Pull a couple out at random and test them, right? Make sure you can get just into that front knuckle of your thumb. That's how you know there's 28 in there and, and really make sure that ammo is there, right? I heard one horror story where someone was doing a pre-combat inspection and they started pulling out mags out of a guy's kit and they were full of blanks because they'd been training earlier and uh, they started checking all his mags and all of his mags are blanks, right? 
That's one, that guy obviously didn't do his own PCCs, and two, that's why we do pre-combat inspections. So, keep that in mind when it comes to checking stuff. You want to make sure to check things. If you're the team leader, assume your guys are squared away and verify, right? Trust but verify. You wanna, yes, I trust you all, you're competent, and now we're just gonna confirm that everybody's squared away and nobody missed anything because that's easy to do. People miss things, people make mistakes. This isn't about being a drill sergeant, this is about having another layer of protection for everybody to make sure that stuff's good to go. So, check ammo, because obviously that's important. This is not necessarily in chronological order of how you should check them or level of importance even, it's just how the acronym falls out, okay? Uh, the next thing, weapon. Uh, is their weapon functioning, right? You can do a function check. Is it lubed? That's super important with ARs, right? In my opinion, you should just take that bolt carrier out, dunk it in a bucket of lube and shove it back in the gun, right? Is the gun properly lubed? Um, are all the optics working, the lights working, the lasers working? Do they have extra batteries for everything? Uh, is their sling squared away and ready to go? Are there any loose bolts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like, make sure you're checking all that stuff on your own gun and then again, spot check things on other people's guns to make sure that they're functioning. Personal camo, right? So this is dictated by the environment that you're going in, right? But whatever that means for that environment, whether it's full woodland BDUs and face paint, or if it's just like an overshirt over a, a slick plate carrier, right? Like what is the personal camo for what you're doing? That's what you want to inspect, right? Um, face paint is good if you're out in the field, use it. <laughs> uh, any, uh, there should be no exposed skin out in the field. It should either be covered in paint or gloves or a shirt or whatever, because skin, especially for us Caucasian folks, shines uh, really well, especially at like dawn, dusk, and night. Uh, it really shines, so we want to make sure to cover that. Uh, personal camo, that also falls under things like, uh, you know, is your hat or helmet scrimmed? Uh, you know, do you have a, appropriate camo that's not going to interfere with your equipment? Um, is your BDU tailored to the environment? Stop BDU, battle dress uniform, right? Your shirt or your pants, like make sure that's of course tailored to where you're going and what you're doing. Equipment, so equipment is like standard equipment, right? So things like uh, your laser on your AR might be a good example, right? Or a smoke grenade that you carry on your team. Like is all of the general equipment squared away ready to go, right? Is your water, are your water bottles full? Think through stuff like that. Is your blade sharp? Is your lighter working? Check all of your equipment to make sure that's squared away, ready to go. Did you pack enough fuel tabs for your little field stove thing that you're gonna use to heat your water up to make some hot cocoa later when you have a nice relaxing evening? Radio, radio gets its own category. Uh, so depending on how you run radios, right, you're gonna want to make sure that your radios are squared away and ready to go. Does every guy in your crew have a radio so you can all talk to each other all the time? Uh, if so, are all the channels on the same? Does everybody have a spare battery? Is everybody's radio charged? Right, does everybody have their call signs worked out? Like how are you gonna run your radio? Maybe radio just means that, hey, we have a radio guy and we're gonna inspect the radio and make sure that that's ready to go and all squared away. Special equipment. So special equipment is something that you have that's just special just for this mission. Like maybe a set of wire cutters or a sledgehammer or a crowbar or a breaching shotgun or something like that, right? Maybe there's some kind of special piece of equipment that you're bringing along just for this mission. Uh, your NVGs could possibly fall into here. They could also possibly just fall into your equipment, right? All that stuff that's maybe just special just for this outing, make sure that's squared away and ready to go because you probably don't have that on your kit recent or often, so you're probably not checking it all the time. So you wanna make sure extra special attention is cared to just the special equipment. Again, because if you're bringing it along just for this mission, it's probably mission critical equipment, and if it's not working, that's gonna be a big problem for you. Orders, uh, do you understand your orders, right? Do you understand what, what we're doing, what our objective is, what the commander's intent is? We'll get into what that stuff means a little bit later in this series. Uh, do you understand that? As the team leader, are you able to clearly explain it so everybody understands it, right? So this is a helpful kind of acronym to go through for your pre-combat checks, pre-combat inspections, to make sure everybody's on the same page equipment-wise and everybody's squared away to go. Again, think of it as that extra safety net level of security to make sure, not necessarily to make someone do a bunch of push-ups. Although, hey, you can make people do push-ups in your crew if that's how you wanna run it. When it comes to observation or viewing your sector, generally, if you're here 
and you're looking down this way, you want to just kind of look in a lazy S pattern, right? You're scanning left to right, near to far, because you always want to be scanning, particularly when you're out on patrol, this is important, right? You always want to be looking around to see what's going on. And so a really good way to do that is the S pattern. This is a common military, uh, way to look at things that's been around for, I don't know, a long time, probably my entire adult life, maybe longer. Uh, but generally that's how we look at things. So when you're out and you're patrolling and you're practicing and you're looking around, think of looking in that S, right? Front to back, like near to far, excuse me, and left to right. Real quick, helpful tip on that. When you're in the woods and stuff, remember to look through the foliage, not at it. Uh, that will make sense. Go out and practice that, but make sure to look through the leaves, through the foliage, trying to see what's on the other side, rather than letting your eyes stop and focus on just those leaves. There's a whole bunch we could say about nighttime and night vision and both natural and artificial. But again, just to keep this quick, cause I'm assuming you have some familiarity here. Your natural eye takes a long time to acclimate to the nighttime. Uh, it's something like 30 to 45 minutes. Okay. And it can get wiped out with any kind of white light and your night vision really gets critically wounded. Should we say at that, at that point, and then it takes another 30, 40 minutes to develop. Uh, so once you develop natural night vision, assuming you're not running NVGs, make sure to do your best to preserve that natural night vision and not use any lights because that will of course hurt it. If you are, if you have time before you go out, sit in a dark room for 30 or 40 minutes to develop that natural night vision before you head out to do whatever it is you're going to do. If you're using NVGs and stuff like that, right? That's going to destroy any natural night vision you had because your eyes are looking at a screen. That's essentially what you're doing, right? So your eyes going to acclimate to the light on that screen, not the light in your surroundings. Uh, night vision equipment is fantastic and wonderful and you should own some and I've done videos on that, but just think about these considerations. Uh, if you have thermal, so much more the better, right? Thermal's great. When thinking in terms of your personal camouflage and camouflage in general, uh, it's helpful to think about why things are seen, right? So shape, your, your human eye understands how shapes work, right? And you don't want to have a shape that is distinctly human. That's why we do things like put scrim on helmet because it helps break up the outline or the shape of who you are and what a head looks like, right? The human face is extremely recognizable. And that's why we put camouflage paint to again, break up the look of that face because that distorts things. Shine, uh, things in nature in general, right? Don't shine. Uh, maybe like water in a Creek. That's about the only thing I can think of. But if you have anything metallic that shines, right again, that's going to be instantly recognizable. That's why we paint our guns. That's why we cover up shiny things. That's why we don't, we don't wear bright silver, like sparkling armor, like knights in the medieval era, right? We're not trying to do that because we're trying to blend. So nothing should shine on your equipment. Don't clear coat your guns. I've you know, it's self-admittedly made that mistake before, but when you paint your gun, don't put a clear coat on it because that's going to give it a little bit of a sheen. Shadow. So again, you got, you got to understand how things cast shadows, particularly at night under moon shadow, that can be a bigger deal. Uh, but you have, need to understand how shadows work, right? Use shadows to hide in when it comes to like foliage and stuff like that. And at points you need to pay attention to where your shadow is casting or what kind of shadow your position is creating surface. You know, I'll be honest. I don't entirely know why that one's there. That one kind of relates to shine, but again, just this idea that if you have a non-natural surface, right, that's going to be more easily recognizable than, than a covered or natural one silhouette. Uh, so silhouette is, you know, we talk about like skylining yourself or again, showing your outline again, it relates to shape, right? A lot of these are interrelated, but like if you're on a hill, uh, and you stand right here on the top. Well, oh, that's terrible. You stand right here on the top of this hill. Okay. Uh, and I'm down, I'm over here and I'm looking at you at that hill. I can clearly see your silhouette and your outline, right? That's called skylining yourself. So be careful. Don't skyline yourself. That's why we don't walk on the top of hills, right? We walk right here. So we're not skylining ourselves as easy. Uh, but pay attention to what kind of outline you're giving in which direction. Spacing, you know, th this one again, some of the stuff is a little nitty gritty for me and I'm kind of like, eh, whatever. But in general, you know, you want to break up your spacing between you and your guys. Nature doesn't have uh, even spacing, right? So if you're all perfectly spaced out, that's not exactly what you want. You want to kind of vary that from time to time uh, or vary distance between patrols and stuff like that. Movement, uh, quick jerky movement is going to be more easily seen, right? The human eye, again, is very good in general and it's very good at picking up 
movement. Most often things are seen because of movement, right? If you're really cammied up and, and you're looking good and you just plant yourself in the woods, chances of me seeing you are pretty poor. But when you start to move, that's when my eye can pick that up. So we want to be very careful about movement. Sometimes it means you need to move really slow. I mean, hey, once the shooting starts, obviously move fast. But up until then, right, you need to move slow. Uh, the sniper manual from the US Army does a great job talking about stalking and, and moving slowly. So we want to think about that when it comes to movement. Uh, sometimes, depending on what you're doing and what you're after, you know, your patrol might take like an hour to cross 100 yards. It might take five hours to cross 100 yards, right? Because you want to match your movement to not be seen depending on what you're doing. In general, if you're scanning your area, right, try to use your eyes to move as much as possible. Try to swing your head in slow, steady movements rather than like quick bird-like movements, right? You get the idea. Muzzle flash. First of all, use a suppressor, okay? Like that, that seems pretty, pretty obvious at this point. Uh, so, but second of all, you know, understand that your muzzle flash, both the sight of it, again, particularly at night, uh, and the uh, dispersion that, that it causes on the ground or whatever, uh, and, and it's blast, right, can be a problem and give your position away. That's again why we really try to use suppressors because they're great at controlling both of those things. That being said, you know, if you only have rock an A2 flash hider, those are pretty good at their job. You just still need to be concerned about muzzle flash from time to time because that was one thing that can give your position away. Down here, uh, aircraft and thermal. Uh, quick thing on aircraft, you don't look up at aircraft, right? Because that's a good way to, again, give your position away and your face is easily recognizable. So we don't look up at aircraft. Uh, and thermal, you know, in the textbook, right, they talk, he talks about uh, using vegetation to mask thermal. I don't know about that. Everything I know about thermal is it's really good and it's pretty hard to hide from. So avoidance is your key, uh, your, your best prevention there. However, you know, if you want to dig deeper into that and, and figure out ways to defeat thermal, you can do that. I just wanted to note it here. When it comes to locating bad guys, uh, it's nice to be able to use distance, direction, and description, the triple D, as, as kind of a quick handy thing, right? You know, 300 yards to the north by the red barn, right? Like that's a good way to help people locate on what's going on and where the bad guy is when you can find that out. Uh, so that's just a helpful little acronym to keep in your pocket, maybe make your team's SOP, whatever. In, in the book, he goes through this big thing about directly right and half left and whatever. I just prefer the clock method, meaning in front of me is 12 o'clock, right? And that's how I'm gonna use that to locate bad guys. So if up here is 12, behind me is six, three and nine, right? I'm gonna say, hey, 200 yards, one o'clock, you know, by the house, that's where the bad guy is. So that gives everybody a real good direction of understanding what's going on, right? 12 o'clock is right in front of us. I'm saying one o'clock and I'm explaining the, the distance and the description. That's the method that I personally am gonna use. If you wanna go into what he uses in the book, knock yourself out, but I've just found this to be much simpler. Two other things to talk about when we talk about locating bad guys. Uh, one is tracers. So remember, tracers work both ways. If you're trying to pinpoint uh, a bad guy and where they are, it might be good for your team lead to carry like one mag with tracer rounds in it so that, that he can do that and, and direct fire onto where you need to direct it onto. Uh, in general, I, I hesitate to do that though, because again, in our context, right, normal everyday people, we don't have access to all the firepower. And so we need to probably can't work on being hidden and, and work on this camouflage thing much more than like big army. Therefore, it would probably behoove you more to not use tracers. It's an idea, you can keep it in your back pocket, but in general, I would probably stay away from that in our context. In the book, he talks about uh, FCOs or fire control orders. Uh, I, in general, think that that's probably not needed. We're not gonna spend a lot of time here on that, but FCO, fire control order, right? Like, Bob, I want you to shoot this fast at this guy on my signal or now or whatever. Again, if we have everybody that we're assuming is generally squared away and we're letting people do individual thinking, I don't think we need to be issuing fire control orders. The one place where you might need to do that or would be helpful to do that would be crew served weapons, but you don't have any crew served weapons. So that's probably not a useful thing. But just so you know, FCO, fire control order. 
couple other things to note here. Hand signals. Uh, you should have them in your crew, you should use them. There are tons of YouTube videos out there on what hand signals are and which, what you can do and whatever. Just remember, there's no Bible of hand signals, okay? If you wanna make a hand signal up for your team that means something, knock yourself out, like it doesn't matter. All the hand signals are made up anyway. Uh, but just use what works for you and your team to be able to communicate. Realistically, you probably only need like five or 10 hand signals to have a really uh, efficient patrol. Um, so learn some of those, go out with your guys and walk around and you're gonna get used to those real quick. Uh, we're gonna talk about this probably more in patrols, but they talk about halts uh, in this chapter and he talks about a short halt, uh, an admin halt and a sills halt, right? So sills, uh, stop, look, listen, smell. Uh, that's what you're gonna do on that halt. Stop, look, listen, smell. Um, so that's a, often what you do when you go out on a patrol. You're gonna, your first halt's gonna be a sills halt. Everybody will stop for five, 10 minutes, whatever. You'll take your hat off. You'll just kind of sit there and kind of get used to the environment, right? You're gonna stop, you're gonna look around, you're gonna to listen to the environment, you're gonna smell what's there, right? When it comes to smelling, you're smelling for the five Fs, fuel, fire, feces, uh, food, and something else, I can't remember. Freshly turned soil, that's what it is. Uh, but that is uh, something that you can do when you're out there. And then on patrol, you can take multiple sills halts, right? Whenever you get into a new environment or you need to get reacclimated, you can always take a sills halt. Uh, but those are really to get used to your environment. And then the last one is an admin halt. Again, we'll probably cover more of this in the patrolling chapter, but a short halt is just, hey, we're just gonna stop for a minute. Admin halt is probably the leaders need to talk and conference and figure out what we're gonna do next. These are the different kinds of halts that we'll get to later. On halts, you'll have different levels of security. Uh, the term you'll hear a lot is stand to. That means everybody's on security, right? Everybody's alert with a gun loaded, ready to rock. I hope your gun's loaded, otherwise I don't know what you're doing. Uh, ready to rock. And you most often do that at dusk and dawn because uh, you know that's where a lot of attacks happen, right? Again, that's more of a big army thing, but it's still something to pay attention to and to be able to say, hey, we're gonna have a stand to right now and everybody knows what that means, right? Then you can do 50% security, which is you know everybody breaks down to their buddy pairs, one buddy's on security, one buddy's not, and you could potentially go all the way down to 25% security. Now listen, if you're running around in a four, six, eight man crew, uh, you're probably not gonna go down to 25% security because that means one or two guys are actually watching what's going on. And one or two guys watching everything in an eight-man crew is just really hard to do, right? So the lowest you're probably gonna go is 50% because then at least you got four guys that can pay attention to what's going on in the world if you got eight or, you know, again, two. Most often though, everybody's pulling security all the time because if you only got four or eight guys, you just don't have that many people in order to give up security. Some other considerations when it comes to field craft and basics that I just thought about as I was reading through this chapter and preparing this talk. Uh, one, poncho and poncho shelter, right? Like if you don't know how to make a, a shelter with your poncho and some paracord, you should probably look up how to do that. And if your guys don't know how to do that, you should probably look into how to do that. So that if when it comes time to bed down for the night or whatever, and it's raining or whatever, you can set up a poncho shelter. That, that's just something you should probably know how to do. Uh, knots, you should be up on your knots. Do you know how to tie a bowline knot, right? Or a trucker's hitch or whatever. If you're not, practice that. I try to practice my knots because I'm trying to improve in that area. But that's something that you, sh you and your guy should know how to do and know a couple basic knots for, again, stuff you're trying to accomplish, like building that poncho shelter, those knots will come in handy. Fire, now listen, most often, uh, you're probably not gonna be making a fire if you're out doing goon stuff, right? Because fires are bright. Uh, however, it's probably always a good idea to keep a lighter on you just in case, and it's a good idea to have some kind of fire starter and have practiced that and know how you're gonna make a fire if in the event of emergency, you needed to do that. Uh, March, Th this is one I'm surprised wasn't in the, the basics and, and field craft book, but you should have a basic understanding of March, right? Massive bleeding, airway, respiratory, circulation, uh, hemorrhage, head, hypothermia. So you should have a basic understanding of, of how to do that. If everybody on your team doesn't have a basic understanding of March or how to apply a tourniquet or how to use what's in their IFAC or know that you use your IFAC on you and you never use your IFAC on someone else, that's again, something you should understand in your crew and you guys should talk through that. Team SOPs, you can have team SOPs for literally anything, right? 
team standard operating procedures for literally, literally anything. But you should have thought about this a little bit beforehand. The best way to find that out is to go out with your guys and do stuff and you're gonna come up with SOPs as you train and practice, right? Be like, okay, well that doesn't work. So in the future, if this happens, everybody's gonna do X or Y or you know what? We're all gonna store our med kits on the left side right up front because that's just the simplest so we know everybody's med kit is or whatever. But you need to start having team SOPs that comes from training together and that's where you're gonna start to build those team SOPs based on your guys' skill set, what you're trying to accomplish, and your tactics. Okay, so this is the end of the first lecture on fieldcraft and basics. Our next one, I think, is battle drills and movement, so that will be a little bit more interesting, and I'm sure all of these are gonna get much longer than this video, so buckle up. Do brave deeds, and endure. <laughs>